Hello everyone and welcome to episode 298 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now on today's episode, I'm joined by the incredible actress, director, producer and all-round absolute legend, Sadie Frost. Yes, you heard me right. Sadie's joining me today to talk all about her brand new film, Rise of the Foot Soldier Vengeance, which is in cinemas everywhere from the 15th of September. But not only that, we also talk about her career to date, also her life recently where she's been directing a documentary and so much more. And I can't wait to share this interview with you in just a couple of minutes time. As always, I always like to touch base and talk about my last episode. It was literally only out a couple of days ago, but I was joined by Jacob Rice from the awesome band Super Love. A great interview, and I've seen so many people on Twitter and Facebook that hadn't heard of this band. They've listened to the interview and now gone and checked out the band, and that for me is the ultimate compliment. So thank you to everyone that took the time to listen, and if you haven't listened, it's all there, available for whenever you want. But as I said, today's episode is with the legend Sadie Frost. But just before I hit that play button, let's give a big shout out to the sponsor of the podcast, Richer Sounds. Each and every month they sponsor this podcast, which allows me to go out there and help do interviews across the whole country for you guys at home. Without their support, this podcast couldn't continue. So if you're in the market for a TV, home cinema surround sound system, headphones, go on richersounds.com or visit one of their stores. Right, now it's time to get to the interview. So here's me and Sadie Frost talking all things film. Hi Sadie, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today on the Mark and Me podcast. You're welcome. (laughs) What I love to do with all guests that come on the podcast, I'm nearly at episode 300 now and I've had Mads Mikkelsen, Kevin Smith, Anthony Hopkins, a whole range of different guests, but they all get the first question, which is the same. What I like to know is what, when you were a child, made you want to become an actor? Was there a certain film or a TV show or something that you watched as a kid that made you fall in love with cinema? I think for me, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I wanted to be an actor was it was a way of getting attention from the adults. So I used to like performing, you know, yeah. when there was like we were on the hippie trail or something, I'd get everyone's attention. So I started off just like performing, you know, getting up on a table and and having a dance and and doing a soliloquy from very early on. But then I saw films like, I really liked films like West Side Story. Um, I liked all the old, all the old Hollywood films. And um, I I would say it was West Side Story, just like the emotion and the entertainment and the singing and dancing. It was just such a kind of escapist film that um, I really, yeah, I, I watched it over and over again. And at that young age, seeing all the colours and the cinematography and all just the the sounds and everything that makes cinema so exciting. Did you have a family that would encourage you then to go down that kind of route to become an actress? Because some people are like, you need to get a real job and not take it seriously. Or did you have a very supportive family that believed that you could go far in that industry? I did. Um, My parents were very bohemian. My dad was an artist and my mum was actually in a kind of theatre group. touring theatre group and they really encouraged it and I kind of, I got a scholarship to go to drama school when I was 11 and um, yeah it was very much encouraged in our family but it, it, my mum they would they would appreciate anything any career that we'd gone into all there's a lot of brothers and sisters but um, no I think they were very behind me um, they knew that that's what I wanted to do and, and I, I loved it from a very early age. That's amazing. Do you remember the point in your career, and I know you've been in some huge films and TV and stuff, but the moment when it felt like you'd made it, like you'd felt like this feels like it's going to be something I can earn enough of and make a name for myself. Was there a turning point or a certain role that just felt inside like I've made it? This is something like feels really positive. I think because my career has gone so up and down um, through different periods of my life, you know, being different ages and you know, raising children and and um, being a mum was you know and all that kind of stuff. You know, it is it, it's had it, it's had to evolve into so many different things. And I guess when I was younger, you, you have more opportunities in a way when you're kind of playing the leading lady type roles and you're auditioning for um, every big film there is. And I guess it was in my twenties when I was signed by CAA, and I had a fantastic agent, and I was screen testing with people like. 
Sylvester Stallone, Michael J. Fox. Um, I I was I had everything on a plate. Um, I really um, was being sent the best scripts, and that was when you know Francis Ford Coppola saw me in Dracula, and I got that role. And then everybody, I was on everybody's kind of um, mind, and I was auditioning for everything. And and then I actually decided at that point that I didn't want to take that that kind of path in my career. And I came yeah. back to England and pursued independent, small independent films. Um, I made that choice because I was a mother and I wanted my son to, to school in England. And, you know, that that did kind of, I think in some ways you get one big opportunity. Um, well, for me, I did. And if you don't take that big opportunity, it's going to be harder and harder to get the kind of roles you wanted. But I never felt like resentful or bitter because I made that choice for my family and whatever role I play, whether it's uh, a, a small supporting role or an ensemble or a cameo or a lead role, everything has um, a different experience and I take from it whatever I can. That's amazing. And those things like I'm not a parent, but there's some things that you don't want to have to say no to and missing out on kids growing up and sports days and events and birthdays. You can't ever get those times back. And, you know, there must've been a point when you thought to yourself, I don't want to do a press junket and miss out on this. I don't want to go to a film premiere and have to miss out on another night of my children. So I suppose looking back, you'd never have any regrets. No, not at all. And, and, and I think things happen for a reason and, and things, um, evolve I went in to uh, pursue um I had a, my own fashion label that did really well I produced films um you know the one of the, the films I'm really proud of is a film that I produced co-produced um was a film with um Samantha Morton and Billy Piper Amelia Jones and Bella Ramsey that Tom Beard directed um that was called Two for Joy that was in the Edinburgh Film Festival and to produce a film of that caliber with such fantastic female um, actresses, I just felt, you know, that for me was a, a really important thing because I, I made, when I was producing, I was making films that were very, I felt like um, quite cutting edge, um, quite risk-taking. Um, and I did that. And now, even though I'm still acting, I'm directing now and I'm directing my second documentary, which is about Twiggy. So I love film in all kind of capacities, whether I'm acting, producing and directing and whatever opportunity comes my way, that's what I, I take and I make the most of every, as I said, every opportunity. I had Alex Winter on only a couple of weeks ago, who's obviously now gone down the world of doing documentaries. He does stuff on YouTube and um, all different subjects. And as a documentary maker from someone who was in front of the camera so often, do you feel that's given you a huge advantage now you're making documentaries and doing this stuff on Twiggy, which you talked about having that experience of how to treat an actor because you've been in those shoes and how to treat a crew and be on set and put documentary stuff together? Do you feel that that's given you the knowledge and experience to then appreciate being a director? I think so. I think I feel very comfortable being on set. So um, to make that kind of transition um, from um, in front of the camera to behind felt really natural and, and for me to kind of have a voice and be having a kind of sensitivity and an understanding and yet yeah, being able to whether I'm doing you know reconstruction which I did with um, Camilla Rutherford who played Mary Quan in in the dock you know I, I, I kind of wrote scenes and, and worked with her and it felt very kind of um, natural because I understand to a certain degree dialogue and how an actor feels um you know for me it's whatever side you're on it's storytelling and it's telling the the richest luscious story um I think for me as well it's always been about um have you know having a, a voice for women and that Mary Quant you know telling her story and her legacy was important now Twiggy you know what she's done for women how things have changed um the evolution of you know, how things, you know, in that industry, how things have changed. And, you know, whether it's acting in a, in a role or, um, you know, direct uh, producing a film with Samantha Morton, you know, it's it's just a very, it's a very empowering thing to to do, to do something that you really believe in. 
And with directing a documentary, I, I'm a huge fan of documentaries. I spend most nights with my wife watching them on Netflix and seeing every type of documentary you can see. But being um, in the cutting room and directing and editing a, a documentary it always blows my mind trying to get so much footage and so much material down to a realistic kind of time for the viewer. So you might have like an hour and a half or two hours to tell a story. Does it feel quite, does it feel really difficult seeing so much left that didn't make the final cut, having to kind of be brutal and say, I can't fit this in? Absolutely. And that's what I'm being right the second, because I, 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 the documentary was two hours and we need it for uh, for the BBC to be, you know, 90, 90 minutes. Um, So I've been back into the edit suite getting rid of 30, 30 minutes, which is really hard. That's a lot of footage, yeah. It's a lot of footage into kind of when you, you've got someone's career that spanned, you know, you know, five, six decades, that, that's pretty impossible. But you have to be ruthless and you have to get rid of all the kind of fluff. And um, but then every and then when you kind of show it to people, which is it's like asking someone and um, telling them what name you're going to name a baby before you you have it, because everyone will have an opinion. And when you when you show, obviously you want some feedback, but every single person you show your rough cut too will have a different a different opinion so you you, you might have 20 sets of con- contradictory notes um but the interesting thing is like you know during this time of, of directing and by the time I finished Twiggy it would have been two years um is is being able to go and act you know I um having a part in in, in Foot Soldier um being offered that which was so refreshing after like the stress of making Two for Joy the stress of making Mary Quam, um, stress of making Twiggy, like those films, like the weight is on your shoulders where it comes to finance and, um, you know, delivery dates. And there's so much stuff to go, you know, you're living, breathing it for two years, 24 seven. And then to be able to kind of get offered a role in, in, in a really established, um, you know, um, kind of a, a set of movies with, with wonderful actors in a British in, independent film and, you know, I can't say much about my part or my character, but, you know, you know, I, I think I, I got, you know, pure emotion from just like being on a set that wasn't my own set that I could just like just turn up and have catering and work with brilliant actors and, and, and a, a lovely director and, and just, you know, just turn up for the like the performing on whatever level it, it would be. With the Foot Soldier franchise, it blows my mind because it's such a success story that this is the sixth film in the UK kind of um, franchise now. I know you can't talk about your character much and we don't want to give any spoilers away because the fan base of these films is hardcore. Like, people adore these films. But to be involved in something so gritty, such a great revenge thriller, uh, I, I always think of it's like a British get Carter. That's the kind of feel I get from it. Um, What was it like working on set? Like you said, it was so refreshing because you've been in these directing uh, roles for the last couple of years and producing and stuff, but working with the director, Nick and the producer, Andrew, who have got such a great name, who I think have still a massive career ahead of them. It must've been absolutely awesome to be on set every day, taking part in something that is so well established in such a short space of time. 100%. 100%. I mean, I think it's always scary when you turn up um, on location when you don't know the cast and crew and you usually kind of turn up late at night and everyone's in the bar and you feel very kind of, you can feel very intimidated. But actually, everyone was really welcoming and there was like friendly faces like Jamie Foreman, who I went to school with, and Tara Fitzgerald, who I've known for, for years and, and you know, Craig and Nick and, and everybody and I like the way, you know, it's just so nice to kind of, I mean, they're very professional, but to just turn up on set and be with really nice people, but they, they, they duck and they actually kind of make you feel part of it and welcome, even though you, you haven't been on this six film journey. And, um, and, and Nick was really great with the direction, you know, he, you know, because you were, when you've been acting as long as I have and doing all kinds of bits and pieces and, you know, you work with so many different types of directors and you just want to have a director that you get a bit of feedback from. And, and you actually, and I actually did. And, um, you know, I didn't really know much about the franchise. I, I, I don't really watch 
kind of it's an action I don't watch you know my thing is not watching action movies so you know but my kids and my boys had had said to me how amazing they were and when I told them that I was um having a role in role in the film uh, you know a lot of they lose their minds like mom's gonna be in this film (laughs) a lot of uh a lot of people reacted that way which is really nice you know and um yeah, it's really, I'm really excited to be part of it. You know, I'd probably be like when I'm tomorrow, I'll have my eyes covered in any of the violence bit, violent bits, but you know, it's going to be very interesting. Does it now give you a taste to want to do more acting again? Uh, I know with your roles, you can be quite um, sparse in taking a bit of time off doing directing, yeah. doing producing. Are you now like, I just want to do some more acting for a bit and not be in a, a kind of editing suite? I would love to be doing more acting. I just did a, a part in a TV series called Geek Girl for, I think, for Netflix. And this year I've done a few a few roles in in some films. Um, a couple of times really good projects have come my way and I haven't been able to actually commit to them because of, of the directing I've been doing. But I think next year and after the strike, I definitely want to be doing more acting. You know, I was I did a few films and things that I was really excited about. I was in a had a great partner film called Chelsea Cowboy, um, which just kind of never got finished. And you know, it kind of it shows you how complicated the film industry is, and how you know you you can you know there were some wonderful performances in that film and actors, and everyone put their heart and soul into it, and and you can work you know a long you know a lot of months, and then the film for some reason doesn't come out. Um, but no, you know, but again, it was a good experience and it just made me think that I really like doing character roles. Um, you know, that was a really, um, fun character role. And I think it's very limited as you get older as a woman, you know, it is very competitive. There aren't that many roles. Um, they're quite, um, limited. So when you get, you know, any kind of role, it, it, it's exciting, but I I'd love to be able to be doing something that was a bit more consistent, I think next year when um, when I finish Twiggy, because I don't think I'd probably truly be finished Twiggy until after Christmas. No. And uh, with the writer's strikes, obviously everything gets delayed as well. And we'll hope that there's a big positive outcome for everyone with that. But Absolutely. An article I read that was only recent that you did for The Express was saying how you've changed your kind of approach on life. And I'm 41 and uh, you were talking about how you've started to embrace your 50s. But I started to really embrace my 40s. And it might sound crazy, but I don't want to be the person at a party now who only went because I didn't have that fear of missing out. I prefer Mm. to be at home with my wife, with my dogs in the countryside. I've moved away from the city. And I related a lot where you were saying that you probably want a bit more of a quieter life and just not being the person that has to be seen at places. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, it really felt like it touched something inside. I can't say I'm a big party animal that was yeah. out with all these celebrities or anything like that. But I, think... I, I truly believe that the older I'm getting, the less I need and I'm just mm-hmm. happy with the little things in life. I mean, I, I do think like certain times and decades go through time. I mean, obviously the younger generation, I go out to Soho and I'm seeing everyone's having a great time, but, um, you know, there, there was a there was a lot of fun in in the in, I guess in the sixties, the twenties, the sixties, and I guess there's a lot of fun in the nineties. And we the, a, a lot of the people that I was hanging out with were you know actors, musicians. It wasn't it wasn't a kind of planned thing. It just happened that we were in a group of people, and suddenly start, everyone kind of started doing well. Um, and then for me, you know, I went on and had kids, and um, it was a, a kind of interesting group of people and 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 you kind of get carried away with a, a certain movement or a certain time and bring your kids up or whatever and then slowly certain things can get boring and you become jaded or but I actually realized that I, I'm kind of ending up where I started because I was always quite a grounded person coming I always started did yoga from a very early age and I liked um kind of like the hippie lifestyle because of my parents and you know I think I was always a bit intimidated and overwhelmed by big socializing groups and things. And I, I used to kind of go, go along with it or go to a gig and realize, you know, I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't really like crowds and I didn't really like loud noise and loud music. So, you know, you find, you finally, whatever, whenever, 
whatever time it takes. I think some people find maybe find that out in their 30s or 40s or 50s. You know, for me, I've definitely liked a quieter life for quite a while now. Um, but yeah, there used to be that time where you feel like you're missing out. I don't really feel like I'm missing out ever. I, I kind of, I go by my own drum beat and, you know, that life is good doing that, not being kind of dragged around by other people or doing things that you don't want to do. Perfect. My time's almost up, but what I do with this podcast to everyone that comes on uh, to make it quite personal is the guest that comes on the podcast gets to choose the final song that's played. So after me and you finished um, talking today and I've edited it all nicely for the world to listen to, yeah, any song by any band or anyone in the world that means something to you can be played. So I wondered if there's a song that came to your heart and soul as I asked the question. I know it's difficult because there's so much music out there's there. So many. But I love the reason behind why that song came. Um, I always just like, um, well, I love the Kinks. The Kinks have always been... Unbelievable band. One of my favourite bands. I love every song. And I, I'd say um, Sunny Afternoon, um, my dad worked on the car that was on the album cover. Oh, that's cool. And um, I was always a huge fan of Ray Davis and Dave Davis. And I went to see the musical like three times. I hope they make it a film of 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 that play. And um, their music and Sunny Afternoon for me is a really um, nostalgic song, but it doesn't seem to have dated in my head and I can listen to it any time of the day. Wow, that's a beautiful reason, a beautiful song. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, good luck with the rest of the press. And hopefully our paths will cross again one day. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Take, Take care. care now. Bye-bye. Bye. So there it is. There's my interview with me and the amazing Sadie Frost. What a great guest. Really delightful, really energetic, really happy and just so, so good. So I'm really grateful to have time with her. And I do hope in the future we get her back for more and hopefully talk about her documentaries because that sounds absolutely fascinating. You also heard us on this interview today talking about her brand new role in Rise of the Foot Soldier Vengeance. And as I said, it's in the cinemas from the 15th of September. So go and check it out. Also, if you've enjoyed today's episode, all I ask in return is to share it. If you use Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, please hit that share button or retweet button. It really goes a long way. I say it on each and every episode because this is the only way that Mark and me can grow. I have lost some Patreons recently and I understand how tight it is. Money is awful right now and I understand that all the bills are going up but I'm losing a lot and it is to the point where I'm like I don't know if I can afford to do this at times so I really need the support. So if you can throw me a couple of pounds a month for these podcasts and you're getting at least two a week for literally two pounds you will also get for this a uh, welcome pack, which gives you stickers, badges, an exclusive episode called The Lost Tapes, and so much more. It really goes a long way. So if you can stretch to that on markandme.com, there's a link to Patreon. Please do. Now, I'm going to be back with the big 299, one step closer to the big 300, and that's only going to be in a couple of days' time, and it's with someone that I can't wait to share with you all. So until then, look after yourself, take care, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Now I'm 
sitting here, sipping at my ice cold beer, blazing on the sunny afternoon. Help me, help me, help me sail away. Well, give me two good reasons why. 